Fridays are awesome, the undisputed king of weekdays. I'm Carl Azus. We're starting today's commercial free coverage on the West Coast where wind gusts in the Sierra Nevada mountains have been as high as 147 miles per hour. That's hurricane force. Where seven foot waves have been reported on Lake Tahoe, where as much as 14 inches of rain has fallen near San Francisco. It is a monster of a storm, one of the strongest to hit the area since 2008. Ferry services have been canceled. Schools around the San Francisco Bay Area have been closed. A stream of moist air has flowed to the region from Hawaii. It's affecting California, Oregon, and Washington. You'd think rain would be good for California in the middle of its historic drought, but so much rain in so little time on such dry ground can bring serious flooding. And there's a blizzard warning in parts of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Students, please remember Sierra Nevada Mountains. It's an answer to the weekly news quiz at our website. Teachers, you can find that news quiz on today's transcript page. It's totally free. We put one together for you every week on Friday. It's a great way to quiz your class's recall of topics we've covered or to offer extra credit. Why not? At cnnstudentnews.com, just click under transcript and roll call. Ten news quiz questions are waiting for you there. Time for the shout out. Managua is the capital of what Central American nation? If you think you know it, shout it out. Is it Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, or Nicaragua? You've got three seconds. Go. You'd find Managua in Nicaragua, a nation located between the Caribbean Sea and the Pacific Ocean. That's your answer and that's your shout out. That location is key. The country's government is hoping to build a canal, a man-made waterway between those two seas. Nicaragua is a few hundred miles from Panama, where a canal already exists. Why does Nicaragua want one? Well, the government says building it would create 50,000 jobs, significantly helping Central America's poorest country. Its planned canal would be wider and deeper than Panama's, but thousands of people are protesting the plans. Many are concerned their land would be taken away to build it and that they wouldn't be paid fairly for that. Their concerns aren't the only ones about the project. The Panama Canal may be getting some competition, at least if the Nicaraguan government gets its wish. If all goes as planned, construction on a giant transoceanic canal across Nicaragua will begin as soon as next month. Chinese investment firm HKND Group is leading the project. The planned route is 172 miles long, more than three times the length of the Panama Canal. It comes with the promise of economic benefits, but many questions remain unanswered, like who's going to foot the bill for the $50 billion project. There is no sense, and I want to underscore no sense, as to where this $50 billion would come from. What happens to farmers and indigenous communities along the canal route? And what risks are posed to the country's drinking water? The planned canal cuts through Lake Nicaragua, their primary freshwater reservoir. That's what we need to see more studies on to really have a good sense uh, as to just how severe the damage would be, uh, what it would cost to mitigate some of those damages, uh, how much money would be paid to those persons or companies that are adversely affected. Uh, all this fundamental information uh, has yet to be released by the government or the Chinese company. Despite the concerns, developers stand by the project. Some voices of doubt and even outright opposition have emerged out there. We want to express our understanding. We are saying that all the people who have not gotten the proper information, we are convinced they will be in agreement with this project because it is for their benefit as well. We will talk with each one of them, with every community, with every property owner, homeowner, etc. Others are more skeptical. Will this actually help the economy? Is there a need for two canals in the same region? What if the money runs out? All questions perhaps better answered before the project begins. We've got our rollout and we're not afraid to call it. We're going to start in the Philippines. Brent International School, Subic. Great to see you today watching from Subic Bay Freeport Zone. To the Lone Star State, let's give a Texas-sized welcome to Amarillo High School. The Sandys are in Amarillo. And riding north of there to the Cowboy State, 
Johnson Junior High School is on our roll. We found the Firebirds in Cheyenne, Wyoming. The battery is something we don't think much about unless it's about to go dead. Technically speaking, it's a device that converts chemical energy into electrical energy. It was discovered in the late 1700s by Italian physicist Alessandro Volta. But though it's come a long way since then, it doesn't have every advantage when it comes to power. Lightning in a bottle, that's the battery, corked and on demand. But for all the talk that battery-powered cars are our future, why aren't we all driving them? Think about it. What are the batteries you use every day? The rechargeable lithium-ion ones, right? The ones in your phone or computer? People are obsessed with how long these last. But car batteries, who's pushing for them to last longer? The battery-powered car with the longest range in the U.S. is the $80,000 Tesla S. That lasts about 265 miles before needing to recharge. The second longest, the $30,000 Nissan LEAF, lasts about 84 miles. The average range of a gas-powered Toyota Camry? 476 miles, at a sticker price under $25,000. For all the talk of being efficient and eco-friendly, gas power still wins on what matters most for people, price. That's because car batteries are expensive. And while Elon Musk claims his planned Gigafactory will mass produce lithium ion car batteries and lower their costs by 30%, will that be enough to power our driving future? Maybe in the short term, but some researchers believe that in order to be truly transformative, batteries need to evolve into something completely different. Enter the concept stage. Batteries on a whole new level. One idea, commonly called the air battery, swaps heavy, expensive battery metals for highly reactive and totally free oxygen. Another battery, that's too big for a car, repurposes unused electricity from the power grid. It's called a flow battery. And, as the name suggests, this battery uses liquid flows to generate power. Both kinds of batteries have a long way to go before they're in commercial use. Air batteries need better recharging capabilities, and flow batteries need cheaper organic materials to make them cost-effective. But, researchers are hopeful ideas like these will pan out. To have transformative innovation, researchers say the push and demand must come from buyers. But we don't see that yet. Sure, car makers are selling electric-only vehicles, but their sales are a small share of the automotive pie. The question is, will that piece get big enough for a shift in the auto world? From homes to hearing aids to cars, maybe even planes, batteries are and will continue to energize the future. But will they power the future of travel? You know Dasher and Dancer, I'm not gonna sing. You know Donner and Blitzen too. How about Nemo? Just south of the North Pole in Corpus Christi, Texas, Santa Claus has suited up and dived down to bring a little Christmas cheer, or at least fish food, to all the good little cold-blooded aquatic vertebrates. They might have been threatened with sand and seaweed in their stockings, but they're big fins of Santa, and no one got bitten or hooked at the Texas State Aquarium. He swam to his sleigh, to his school, blew some bubbles, and away they all floated through the aquatic tubble. But I heard him gurgle through the water to me, happy Christmas to all on land and at sea. It was fantastic. CNN Student News is back next week.